going to start out in Luke 1 today. Uh, so last week we looked at the Christmas story. So this is a sequel. This is a Christmas story part two. Um, we began last week before the foundation of the world, in eternity past. And we followed the story of the Son through creation, through the time of the Old Testament, until the moment he left his throne to come to earth. Galatians 4.4 4 said that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. The time was full. So what was so special about that time, you know? We can speculate. We can speculate. I'll say this. This is the first time in history when, by and large, the known world spoke one language. They spoke Greek. Alexander the Great, when he conquered, even though his empire was brief, he was really good at spreading Greek culture and Greek language. So at this point, when the, when the gospel begins, the story of Jesus is, begins to spread, a man could travel from Jerusalem into the known world and not have to learn a new language. He could speak Greek. That's the first time in history something like that happened. Secondly, he is born, as we will read in Luke 2, during the reign of Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus ended the civil wars in Rome, and he instituted what became known as the Pax Romana, a 250-year period of internal peace within the Roman Empire. So now, a guy like Paul could carry the message of Jesus from Jerusalem to Rome, and he didn't have to cross the national boundary. He didn't have to worry about any traveling armies that were going to kill whoever they saw burning down villages. He didn't have to pay tribute to any passing warlords. He could travel, and he could travel on good, strong Roman roads. You could go from Jerusalem, one side, from the east, all the way to the west, out to Spain, and be within the Roman Empire, and relatively travel in peace. Sure, they were robbers. But there wasn't these, these armies and civil wars and massacres that they had previously. So maybe that's why. We don't know. But we know that the time was right. And because the time was right, this isn't just some hole in the wall happening, this event that was obscure in a corner of the world. It became a universal moment that ends up, they say, turn the world upside down. <laughs> Whatever the reason, the time was right. Philippians 2 7 says that he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. You know, man was made in the image and likeness of God. And now, in order to save man, the only begotten Son of the Father, fully God, humbles himself to be made in the likeness of men. It's the opposite of what happened in the garden. Here is contrasted the pride of Lucifer, Satan, who wanted to be like the Most High, and God, who was willing to leave his throne and become like man. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became flesh. Isn't this a great reversal, once again, of the garden? In the garden, man wanted to be like God, and here, God becomes like man. You know? You can call it a divine invasion. Or what a heavenly infiltration. But theologians <laughs> call it the incarnation. In flesh. So we're going to look at this moment in history through three announcements, because God makes three announcements about it. And the first one is in Luke chapter 1, and it's to Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 26, says this. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. God sent Gabriel into the town of Nazareth. Not a big town. It's a little rural place. It's like sending an angel to the town of Nebraska, a town in Nebraska. Anyone from there? Anyone ever go there on vacation? You have? Yeah. What do you, what, you just want to look at some corn? Yeah. Baseball College World Series is in Omaha. There was family. Family, okay. <laughs> um, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, they didn't have a Disney World in Nazareth. All right, this is a, a no-name place. And uh, in this young town, you got Mary, a young woman. Uh, and she's engaged to this guy, Joseph, who's a carpenter. He's a man... Blue-collar guy that's going to work with his hands in this little town. Okay, so imagine for a moment, you know, what Mary thought about her future. You know, they were going to get rich in Nazareth. And it wouldn't grow wealth. Maybe they'd grow a family, right? She'd be a wife to this guy. She was mostly a young woman. Uh, you know, marriage age that time is like 13, 14 years old. So we're talking this young girl about to get married. And Gabriel shows up. Verse 28, And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. 
But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. You know, as a dad, my daughter's here now. I don't know if you guys met her. This is cool, right? So if she was like 13 and 14 years old and some guy walked into our house and said, Hello, favored one. God bless you. The Lord is with you. I imagine she would be a little perplexed at what was about to happen. What are you doing here? I already got a fiance. What's going on here? Why are you in my parents' house? Why are you talking to me? She was very perplexed and she was wondering, what kind of greeting is that? It says, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no ends. That's not what she expected from this guy. The Son of God, the throne of David, reign over the house of Jacob forever. So she's got one question, right? It's a natural question. How's that going to work? She says to the angel in verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So this Holy Child, Son of the Most High, she said, Gabriel said, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You know, Christianity has been compared to some of these Greek myths. But in the Greek myths, you know, when Zeus shows up, he literally impregnates women in a sexual way. There's nothing like that going on here. If you speak to a Muslim, they say, you Christians believe that God slept with Mary. We do not believe that. Mary was wondering that herself. How is this going to work? He said, the baby will be conceived by the Holy Spirit. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And it's actually an amazing thing because when God first created man in the garden, it says he breathed into man and man became a living soul. That word for breath is the same exact word for spirit. It's the same word for wind. It's one word. In Psalms it says that the Holy Spirit brings life to creation. So now here, the Holy Spirit, it's almost a mirror of what happened here, that God is creating somebody. But instead of the dust of the earth, he's creating this child inside Mary's womb. Now, it's strange. Very strange. It's never happened before. And it has not happened since. But now we begin to understand in Genesis 3, when God made the promise that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, now we begin to make sense. Oh, only from the woman. Not from Joseph. Now, there are these liberal theologians that like to say, okay, this is mythical. This is legendary. And the reason why it was so accepted back then was because the people were superstitious. Not like us modern men who know that these things don't really happen. Now, let me just tell you this. Back then, it was hard to believe too. And there were people who did not believe this. In fact, most didn't. Later on, when Jesus is preaching, they actually insult Jesus twice about this. First time, they say, we know who our dad is, Jesus. Who's yours? What are they saying? They're implying that Mary slept around and then got married to Joseph, and nobody knows who the dad is. Secondly, when Jesus is confronting the Pharisees, they say, we were not born out of fornication. In other words, we were not born out of wedlock. You were. So just so you know, man is man. And just because we know a little bit more nowadays, or we think we do, and we have the internet, doesn't mean that the people back then were more superstitious. This was always hard to believe. And I think the reason why Elizabeth was her cousin who got pregnant with John the Baptist, if you read through the beginning of Luke 1, and the reason why she went to Elizabeth's house for three months and waited it out was probably because Elizabeth was the only other person in the world who was going to believe what Mary said. And God knew that. And he gave her this small comfort. Go to your cousin's house and stick around with her. Now, if you still have problems believing this, then I point to you the words of the angel. Nothing will be impossible with God. 
This is how God chose to do it. No man could say, hey, I'm Jesus' dad. He's got my blood in his veins. No. He's the son of God. It's an amazing thing. But he also had to be the son of man. He took on flesh. So he was going to go through this natural birth and be born as a child. And he was going to have to learn. He was going to have to grow. He was going to have to submit to his parents, which Luke makes sure to include a little story where he does submit to his parents. It's a hard thing. It's a humble thing. But why Mary? You know, one of the amazing things about Mary that always hits me is her response to all of this. If you read verse 38, Mary simply says, Behold, the slave of the Lord, the servant of the Lord. She said, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. She accepts this great task and responsibility. When she visits Mary in the next passage, in verse 45, Mary says, Blessed is she, or she visits Elizabeth. Elizabeth says, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. She believed. And this wasn't just some, she wasn't like a grandma, you know? This old, wise lady who had been through life. And, you know, we always look to these women as the mature, spiritual ones who know a thing or two. No. She wasn't this middle-aged mom who was in the middle of raising kids, and she knows all these, and then she looks and she says, okay, I'll do this. I'll, I'll add one more to the, to the, the pile. No. She's probably a 13 or 14-year-old girl who was willing to look at this angel and say, may the Lord's will be done. If that's what God wants me to do, then I'll do it. Spiritual maturity has nothing to do with your age. You know, if we could just get to the point where we simply believe what God says, that's where maturity begins. I know a lot of older people who don't believe a thing about God. And I know younger, I see kids who have more spiritual maturity than anything. Now, they're not mature in other areas of life. They'll laugh at stupid things. They'll do stupid things. But Jesus says all we need is the faith of a child. It's an amazing thing. Mary believed. Now, this announcement is nothing like we would expect. Because what was special about Mary other than that little bit of faith? Why not choose a woman in Jerusalem instead of little Nazareth? Why not choose one of the powerful families that lived there in the city? You see this word favor? She's a favored one. And she found favor with the Lord in verse 30. Favor. You know that Greek word is charis. You ever hear anyone named charis? It means grace. It's the same word for grace. Here, translated favor. Sometimes it's translated kindness. Other times, mostly, it's translated grace. What was special about Mary? Nothing. Except that she found grace. You know, in this first announcement, that's the theme. What is Christmas about? Christmas is about grace. You know, when uh, she visits Elizabeth, she sings this song. And I love her song. Because it reveals what's on her heart. And if you look at verse 51, in the middle of her song, maybe we should just read the whole thing. Should we do that? Starting in verse 46, Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regard for the humble state of his bondsly. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. Now listen to these next three verses here. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. But you see there in those little verses, what is on her heart? She's thinking, why me? Because I'm the humble one. I'm the one who has nothing. I'm not in the big city. I don't have the big money. I'm not marrying into the big family. It's me and it's Joseph. I'm just this young girl in Nazareth. And what has God done? What has he done to the proud? He has scattered them. What has he done to the powerful? He has brought them low. Who has he lifted up? The humble. Who has he filled? The hungry. It's an amazing thought. That's grace. Titus 2.11 says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. You know, 
Christians today, it's tough sometimes living in America. It is. You know, when you travel to some of these other countries and you meet Christians, Christians aren't the rich and the powerful. They're the outcasts. They're the ones that are rejected. They're the ones that are looked down on. They're the ones that are made fun of. They're the ones that the government doesn't respect and is afraid of and persecutes. They're the one that communities, when you get this, your family casts you out, your community casts you out, and you're left with nothing but Jesus. But here in America, we have this strange little culture to where we were on top for so long. And if you wanted to be accepted, you had to be a Christian. If you wanted to be looked at well by your family and by your culture and by your community, you had to go to church. You had to volunteer. If you look at our presidents and all of these rich guys, they all were Sunday school teachers. They had to be. Now, I don't know if they really believe. I hope they did. But now things are slowly beginning to change. That is true. But still to this day, we have this weird thought that, hey, we can follow Jesus and still get all the good things from the world. We can follow Jesus faithfully, and it doesn't really cost us anything. And we begin to compare ourselves to these people in the world, and we think to ourselves that, man, look at those rich people. Look at those powerful people. Look at those people who have all that I want, and we want to be like them. And we begin to measure ourselves by those measurements. And we think that a successful life is a wealthy life. So as long as we have our health, and we have a steady thing coming in for retirement, that will be good. As long as we can stop working at a young age and not run out of money by the time we die, that is a successful life. As long as my kids get into this special school, as long as they get that special job, I have done my job as a parent. And I think we're wrong. That these things, what does God tell us in the Christmas story? That what is the most important thing about a person is whether or not they respond to God's grace. I just read this book. In the year 1400, before Columbus discovered the New World, there was this one priest in Prague, in the Czech Republic, at the time it was Bohemia, and he read the Bible and he says, this is not right. What the church is teaching us is not accurate, and this man stood up and he began to preach the gospel. And the church burnt him at the stake. But before this guy died, his name was John Huss, this is a hundred years before Martin Luther, he left a small body of believers that continued to preach the gospel. And this church spread. For 50 years it spread, and then wars came. Wars came, and these people were persecuted heavily. Their churches were burnt down. It was illegal for them to meet any longer. They were not allowed to read the Bible in their heart language of Czech. They weren't allowed to do anything. So what did these people do? Well, they disappeared. History thought they were gone. Seventy years passed, the Reformation happens, and all of a sudden, this is an amazing thing, all of a sudden, the laws changed to where people could now believe something outside of what the Catholic Church said you could believe. And on that first day, 100,000 people stood up and claimed to be part of this forgotten church. Everyone thought they were all dead. What did you do? They said, we buried our Bibles in our gardens. We would go out there and we would meet maybe monthly, maybe bi-monthly out in the woods to sing some songs together. And they said, well, wait a minute. How in the world... Do these people believe this message still to this day? Because the original founders are all dead. These are their grandkids. And you know where the message continued? It continued in the homes. That these men, they couldn't go to church, they couldn't be accepted in the culture, but they taught their children the Word of God. And those men grew up and taught their children the Word of God. And when the time was right, these grandkids were able to stand up and begin a movement of sharing the gospel. And I think so long about this, and this is even my notes, but it's all about this grace and whether or not we can accept it. What if our church was burnt down today? And what if it was illegal to meet? 70 years from now, if the law changed, would any of our grandkids walk into this church and know the story of Jesus? Would they still believe this, or would it just be snuffed out? The battle begins at home. Discipline begins at home. Sharing grace begins at home. And we need men that will stand up and say, I will be that leader in my home. And if the man doesn't do it, the woman has to stand up and say, I will do what I have to do to make sure that this continues. It's all about grace. 
You know, when I look at my kids, I want them to grow up healthy, of course. I want them to grow up and make as much money as they can. Why not? I want them to use all that money for the glory of God. But I would be a complete failure if they grew up and made all the money in the world, but they don't know who Jesus is. And they don't know what it means to, be, to receive grace and to believe. Christmas is about grace. So maybe you know that, but you've forgotten it. And you're measuring yourself by some other standard. Maybe... Maybe you have everything you want, and your confidence is found in those things. <clears throat> the Christmas story every year brings us back to a time when God did not choose the rich and the powerful. He chose the young, the poor, and the hungry, and he tasked them with raising his son. Christmas is about grace. Now, if we turn over to Luke chapter 2, let's read what else it's about. <clears throat> It says in verse 1, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, another thing Luke does, Luke was a doctor, the author of this book. He's meticulous, and he researched, and he lets us know that this is not some mythological birth, some legendary birth. He tells us exactly when it happened, exactly where it happened, and exactly how it happened. You don't see this in other ancient texts that talk about these religious legends. They don't have a place, a time, a where, and a why, but Luke gives us these things. This census comes out. Everyone has to go back to the land of their family, this original city, and there they have to register because everyone's got to pay taxes. Now, Joseph and Mary, I know in the stories we see Mary sitting on the donkey and Joseph leading her and them walking this 75 miles down to Bethlehem. But more than anything, back then, you would travel in a group with other family members. Just as when you read when they went to the temple, they lost Jesus because there were so many other kids traveling with them. Now, we don't know if everyone from Nazareth came down to Bethlehem. It only would have been the people from there. But if Joseph had any other relatives nearby, they would have caravaned on down. Either way, it's a long journey. Pregnant lady... You know, she probably wrote something. And she gets down here to Bethlehem. Now, this is an amazing thing because in Micah, it says that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So here we have this guy, this emperor, this governor, and he decides he needs some more money. And he wants to know where everyone's from. So he sends out this decree for this census. And everyone goes back to where they come from so I can find out exactly how many people we have in this empire so I can make all this money. And he has no idea where that thought came from. But God uses it. To get the Jesus in the womb to the city he's supposed to be in. And they get there, and he's born. Now, not in a palace in a manger. Not in a big city in a little town of Bethlehem. Not anything like we would expect. We, want you to, we need a bigger announcement, right? We need something. Somebody needs to know. And it's almost like the father's up there being like, someone's got to tell somebody about what just happened here. Let's send, let's send some angels here. So verse 8, it says in the same region... There were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had passed away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. 
But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. So this angel shows up and makes another announcement. Then the choir shows up and they sing. It's just another amazing thought. Who do they show up and tell? Some shepherds. Some working class guys out there watching sheep in the middle of the night. I don't know why. He didn't go to a priest, someone working in the temple, the governor, the king. He goes to some shepherds. You know, God has a strong affinity with shepherds. He is called our shepherd in Psalm 23, and we are called his sheep. He repeatedly calls his people his sheep, the sheep of his pastor. You know, he called Jesus his shepherd. Jesus himself shows up and says, I am the good shepherd. And then when he founds the church, what do they call the leaders of the church? Pastors, which is shepherds, the same word. Under shepherds of the chief shepherd. I don't know why. Maybe because people are a lot like sheep. Maybe because that's the only thing I can think of where a guy leads and guides and feeds and protects and does everything a shepherd does. It's what God does for his people. So these shepherds are out here and they hear this announcement. Guys, while they're working. And they run and they see. And what do they do when they leave? It says they went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard. Isn't it amazing? You know, Mary hears this message of grace, and she sings. Her song is recorded. The shepherds graciously are chosen to receive this announcement. And their response, after seeing it, is to worship. You know, Christmas is about worship. The angels worship. The shepherds worship. Mary worships. And we'll see. There's other groups that worship. Isn't it ironic that to this day, we know when the Christmas season starts because the music changes? We wait all year to hear some Christmas songs. And people who won't darken the door of a church the entire year will just show up around Christmas time. Like we know. Something to sing about. There's a purpose to this worship. You know, Christians of all people should look at the Christmas season, this time of year, as a time to really worship. It's very easy to get caught up in everything else. The events, the gatherings, the food, the shopping, and all those things are fun. And they're all good things. But they're secondary. And we've got to make sure we don't settle for good when there's something better out there. Christmas is a time to set aside for the worship of our Savior. A time to thank God for sending His Son. For allowing His grace to be made known in this world. And I ask you guys, when's the last time you found joy alone in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> and I don't want to be trite, but i got to say it. There is no room for him in the end, right? But I wonder to this day, right now, is there room for him in your schedule? Is there room for him in your mind when it's filled with everything else? The social media, the news, politics, family, friends running here, running there, the stress? Do we put out any time in our days to worship? You know, as I mentioned before, men, have you ever led worship in your home? If you haven't, the first time might be a little awkward. But what a better time to start than Christmas. It's a time when people are like, yeah, okay, we can get together and talk about Christmas. We can get together and pray. Even if you live alone, your schedule fills up fast. Do you ever get alone with God? Why not do it this week? You know, there's five days, Monday through Friday before Christmas. You can read Matthew 1, Luke 1, Luke 2, Isaiah 6, and Isaiah 53. Five chapters, one a day. Reading, thinking over the Christmas story. Thinking over what it means and why he came. That's a challenge. You know, if you don't want to do it alone, what an opportunity to invite your children to take part in this reading and to pray. 
Why not invite someone from here to come over and say, pray with me. Pray through this chapter with me. Let's have some fellowship. It's Christmas time. So one time a year where it won't be as awkward or clunky for the first go. And like the shepherds, we can go our way glorifying and praising God for what we have seen and heard and read and believed. It's about worship more than anything else. And now if you want to turn, we can go to Matthew chapter 2 for the last announcement and the most unlikely one of all. Now, the magi, okay, call them the wise men. We say the song Three Kings, it doesn't say they were kings, but I know what some of you are thinking. They weren't at the manger. We know they visited while he was still young. He was still in Bethlehem. And they came because he was born. So we're going to include it today. It says this in chapter 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler, a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report him to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then... Opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. This is the craziest announcement because the Magi, they are a class of people in the East. If you read through Persian history, there was actually a few years where this class ruled as an emperor. The rule of the Magus, they called it, Magi. These magi are basically astrologers. Astrologers. And, and Daniel, when it lists out magicians and all the bad people that were against Daniel, astrologers are there in the list. This is a pagan thing. These magi are pagan people. They are not Jewish. They are Gentile. They do not worship Yahweh as far as I know. They're looking at the stars and they do those types of things. The most unlikely people Yet God reaches out to them and somehow, through a star, announces the birth of his son. Does that make any sense to us? Because you know, what are they doing looking at the stars at night? They weren't astronomers. They were looking for signs from God. Words from God. They were no better than fortune tellers. And here they see, literally, a sign from God. And he leads them, almost like an invitation to meet his son. And somehow through this, they know enough about him to worship this son. And they bring gifts with them. You know, people ask me, occasionally, what about all the people who lived in all the world before a missionary got there? You know, what, what's, what's with all the, the people in the Western Hemisphere before Columbus showed up? What happened to all of them? They had no idea about Jesus. They had no idea about anything. And the only answer I have is look at the Magi. Because we don't really understand how God reached out to them and how he communicated to them. But we know that somehow he did, and he invited them. And what this tells me is that, number one, God is bigger than we realize. And God can do a lot more than we realize. And God can do things in ways that we do not realize. And his grace knows no bounds. These men, these pagan people, who Jewish men would have found repulsive, <clears throat> show up to worship Jesus. And what do the rulers in Jerusalem do? They just want to kill a kid. They want to know where he's at. 
as we know, so that we, they could kill him. Jerusalem was afraid instead of rejoicing when they heard that Jesus was born. How ironic that God's people reject him, even as a child, when these pagan people, these heathens, they come, spending their money to travel all this way to worship. What does that tell us today about God's grace? What does that tell us today about the gospel, about who was invited? Think about all the people involved in the Christmas story. We have the poor and the hungry, the workers. And the only powerful people that were invited were pagans. That God's people would never want to sit down and eat with. That would not be welcome in their home. And they give gifts. And that's the third theme I see with Christmas, is this idea of giving. You know, Mary received the grace. She says she walked away full. She has received something from God. You know, when the angels announced to the shepherds, it says, For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior. For you. And now God's grace invites these magi to meet Jesus. And when they show up, they give. Isn't it crazy? We still copy them to this day, and we give gifts at Christmas time. But the real gift is not what we give to each other. It's what God has given to us. It says, unto us a son is given. Today the city of David has been born for you, a Savior. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. I hope in the midst of all the gift given this year, every gift you receive or every gift you give reminds me of the gift that God gave to us. And I want you to know that he really did give it to you. It's a personal gift that must be personally received. You know, nobody would know Mary's name. But God did. You know, no one would have cared to announce anything of importance to these shepherds in a field. But God did. And not one of God's people would ever think to invite a magi to God's table. But the Father did. So what makes us think that we are unworthy? Or that we are not invited to this table? That he doesn't really love you? Or know your name? Or care about you? Now I know some people, we look to our past and we say, well, you don't know what I've done. So you're a no better than a pagan astrologer. You say, well, who am I that God would care about me? So you're no better than a, a shepherd having to work in the middle of the night. You say, I'm nobody. So you're like this 14-year-old girl who was about to marry a carpenter in a little tiny rural town that nobody would ever know about if Jesus wasn't from there. The second person of the Trinity wrapped himself in flesh and came to this world as a gift to each of us. So maybe some of you guys believed that, and somewhere along the lines, you just lost the beauty of it. I pray for you, that your heart will be open to the Savior again, and that you would recall and remember and begin to cherish again the love Jesus has for you. Maybe some of you believe it, but life has been so crazy, you haven't really enjoyed it in a long time. And I challenge you to slow down, and make time for the Savior in your heart, especially this week. And some of you are still having trouble believing this, personally trusting. And I just say that the gift is there. Your name's on it. It's for you. God loves you so much. He invites us. He visits us. Calls us to his son. But we've got to respond. I ask you, do you respond in faith? Will you trust him? This Christmas, will you receive God's gift for you? And experience the grace that has appeared to all men and bring salvation? Let's worship Jesus Christ, the Son of God, this Christmas and learn what it means to truly have Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We are humbled to think of this great gift that has been given to us in grace, and we worship you for it and thank you for your grace, freely given, out of love, your abundant kindness to choose us to be your people, we who are far off, Without you and without any hope in the world, you have brought near by the blood of your Son. And we thank you for your amazing gospel, your glorious salvation. And I ask that you work in every heart and every mind here to simply worship you this week and to recall and remember and cherish the story of your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.